PC Best Practices webinar series. The series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project. Uh, the project is funded by the Exascale Computing Project in collaboration with the um, U.S. Department of Energy Computing Facilities at Argo and Oak Ridge and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus. Ashley Bark and I will be the hosts for today's webinar, Tools and the Techniques for Floating Point Analysis. And the webinar will be presented by Ignacio Laguna. Uh, he works at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, at the Center for Applied Scientific Computing. Ignacio's main area of research is high-performance computing, and he also works on program, including program models and systems. He's a 2019 Better Scientific Software Fellow. Uh, you can see the call out uh, in this slide. And he helps code teams to improve the reliability of scientific software through analyzing and debugging floating point software. So uh, going back to the fellowship program, it gives recognition and funding to leaders and advocates of high quality scientific software. So if you go to that link, HTTPS BSSWIO fellowship, uh, you have more information about the program and also um, applications for 2020 are now uh, are open. We have, in quotes, sold more than 180 tickets for this webinar. All attendees have been muted. Uh, as Ashley mentioned before, we'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat, but we prefer that you enter your questions in the Google Doc. You can see the link to that doc. Uh, the webinar will have breaks so the speaker, can, uh, Inacio, can uh, respond to the questions that come in. With that, Inacio, please. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Osni. Um, and also thank you for uh, inviting me to give this webinar. So one of the things that I do at LNL is to develop uh, debugging and correctness tools and um, also performance analysis tools for um, HPC applications. And one of the areas in HPC that, that really intrigued me is a floating point. Um, as we know, floating point is used everywhere in, in scientific computing, but um, even so, I still find it difficult, difficult, difficult. For uh, one of the reasons is that uh, understanding all the details of floating point arithmetic is hard. And um, another problem is that there are not many tools. I find that there are not many tools to analyze floating point. Um, there are several tools to analyze the performance of HPC applications, but not necessarily many tools to analyze floating point. And the few tools that exist are developed by computer scientists, mostly uh, computer scientists like me uh, or others, and, uh, but they are not necessarily well known in the broader community of uh, computational scientists. And so the idea of this webinar is to advertise a bit more some of these interesting tools and, and areas uh, of um, floating point analysis in HPC. So this webinar will cover specifically three things. Uh, the first is uh, some interesting areas of floating point analysis in HPC. The second is some potential issues that may arise when writing floating point programs. Um, I will show you real uh, examples of issues. When I say issues, I don't necessarily mean bugs or software defects. What I mean is potential problems that you may encounter uh, on which you need to pay or you should pay careful attention. And the third is uh, some tools and techniques that you can use to mitigate or sometimes to get more insight from some of these issues. Um, and when I say tools, I mean software that you can download and install and run today, as opposed to uh, research papers that don't necessarily have an existing tool. Uh, one disclaimer is that this, this webinar doesn't cover all aspects of floating point analysis. Uh, we cannot do this in one hour. Um, I will focus particularly on high-performance computing applications. Um, 
I don't mention, for example, issues on finance, ap finance applications or game applications, for example. And um, also keep in mind that this is my view, uh, my view uh, of the issues and tools that I see as a researcher in a national lab. I don't mean this to be a comprehensive overview of all topics and tools that exist in the domain of floating point. So just keep that in mind. So I want to start by giving you an example of what it takes to debug a, a floating point issue in a real code. So this is an example of a floating point problem that uh, occurred um, last year in the development of a new mini application. Um, this was uh, a new hydrodyna hydrodynamics mini application uh, developed here at LNL. And so this happened in the early efforts to port this code to a new system. Um, in this case, this was an IBM machine with Power A processors and NVIDIA GPUs. And as you probably know, moving to a new system, this means using new compilers and different, uh, sometimes using different compilation flags. Um, and for a particular case, the uh, energy value, so this application calculates an energy value and um, there was a significant difference when uh, we use the XLC compiler. XLC is the IBM compiler for C, and in particular when we use a minus O3, so high optimization level. The other compilers in the, in the system produce the expected result, but not XLC. And as you can see here to the right of the, of the slide, and the question we had was, well, we had several questions. One of them was, what, what part of the program is making the compiler produce this very different code? Uh, keep in mind that programmers really want to use O3 or higher level optimi of optimizations to uh, get all the possible performance from a machine. So really using lower levels like O2 or O1 are not really a, a good option. Um, and this problem took several weeks of effort of expert debuggers to, to diagnose. Uh, we isolated the problem to a single function in a, in a region of code that was actually producing subnormal numbers, and this combined with minus O3, uh, which can significantly change the semantics of the program, producing correct results. So this gives you an idea of how, of why having effective tools and techniques to debug these uh, problems is important. And um, we will come back to this case later in the presentation. This is a standard that defines a floating point arithmetic. Um, the latest version of the standard was released in 2008. I will be talking about floating point arithmetic in the rest of the presentation. So it is useful to quickly go over the key concepts of the standard. Uh, uh, one of the concepts is a format, so it defines how to represent floating point data, uh, special numbers, uh, such as infinity, not a number, subnormal numbers, uh, also rounding rules, uh, rules to be satisfied during rounding operations, uh, some arithmetic operations, such as trigonometric functions and the behavior of them, and um, the standard also defines exception handling, uh, for example, what happens when you have a division by zero, or you have an overflow or an underflow and things like that. One of the important problems in developing reliable floating point software is that programmers sometimes don't fully understand all the details of the standard. There is a paper, a recent paper titled, uh, Do Programmers Understand IEEE Floating Point? And I'm giving a reference here for this paper. So the paper presents the results of a survey taken by a 199 developers. And the survey questions about key aspects of, of the standard, um, for example, uh, aspects related to optimizations, uh, the use of, of fuse multiply add operation versus uh, flush to zero. Um, and, and for example, things like can fast math result in non-standard compliant behavior. And what the study found is that developers do little better than chance when they are tested about core properties of floating point and yet they are confident. So I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm uh, giving here a, a reference to the paper. So it's a, it's a good read. I would recommend uh, to read this paper. Um, one of the situations that 
we see sometimes is that when programmers see an incorrect numerical result, they say, well, you know, it's just floating point error or rounding error, so don't worry. The reality is that uh, there are many factors that are involved in producing an unexpected numerical answer. Uh, I list some of them here. So one of those is uh, the precision that you're using, right? Uh, are you using double, single, or half precision? The compiler that you're using, are you using a proprietary compiler or an open source compiler? We have found that the proprietary compilers tend to be more aggressive in the optimizations and then they to, tend to be and to give uh, significantly different uh, results compared to the open source compilers. The language semantics is also important. Um, so for example, floating point is, is under the, under specified in, in languages like C. So the semantics for C are not necessarily the semantics for other languages that you may be using like Python, Julia, or something else. The optimizations level is also very important. Um, you should be careful with uh, minus O3. I'll show you later an example of some examples of why O3 is dangerous. Um, just pay attention to that. The architecture is also important. Uh, are you running this on, on a CPU host or on a GPU or another accelerator? So those are things that you need to keep in mind when you see a result, numerical result that you don't necessarily expect. Now, um, there's, there's this question we have, which is how do we know what floating point code can produce variability? Or, or in other words, how do we know what kind of code we should be careful about when we're running the code in GPUs or in a CPU or with different compilers, right? So we're developing a tool called Variety that allows us to that hopefully will help us answer this question. So what this, this tool does is that it allows us to identify programs that produce floating point variations. So the idea of the tool is that it generates random tests and uh, then compiles the test uh, with different compilers in a given system, and then it runs the test uh, with a given input and checks if the, the results are different. So I'm going to show you a few examples of some um, floating point tests that we found with this tool on which we saw large variations. So here's an example. A, of a random task. It's, it's a random kernel that the, this tool found. Um, you don't really have to understand the test here. Uh, what you have to see is that this is, this is a function uh, that was randomly generated, and we compute a, a variable comp or a, a computation comp, and then we print the value of that at the end of the kernel using uh, 17 digits. And so in this particular case, so the tool tries several random tests and several inputs. And so for a given, for a given input, uh, when we run this in um, IBM system with Power 9 uh, cores and NVIDIA GPUs V100, this is in LNL Lassen system, um, and we use optimization level of 3 for clan running this on the host, we get a NAN, uh, not a number value. But when we run this in the GPU with minus 03 using NBCC, we get a total different result. So as you can see, uh, the GPU result is, uh, is actually a normal number, whereas the result from the host execution is a result of the, an exception, right? so it's, a, it's a not a number uh, value. Now, here we're using 03, right? So we're using a uh, high optimization level. And we know that when we use high optimization levels, the compilers can optimize the code and can produce uh, code that will could eventually result in a very different value. Um, so maybe because we're using O3, this is sort of expected. I wouldn't expect a difference of this uh, of this size because this is, is really a number versus a non-number. But let's say O3 you know, allows this kind of behavior. Now the question is what about when we do O0, right? When we tell the compiler, uh, typically when we do O0, we're telling the compiler, I don't want any optimizations, right? I want you to compile the code. Uh, I want you to generate code as close as possible to the program that I, that I wrote. And so the question is, can with, uh, with O0 still see these cases? And actually, uh, we found cases like that. We're finding cases like that. So there's another random test that we found where for this input, 
and this is this is running all in the host architecture, not the GPU, just the host architecture. Uh, when we run this with Clang and GCC and Excel, we get different results from Excel, as you can see here to the right. Uh, again, this is not not optimized because this is pure O0, right? No, we don't we don't tell the compiler to optimize anything. Now the the difference here is that it's actually a fuse multiply at so. Uh, this particular system we're running on supports uh, FMAs operations, and for some compilers, FMAs are not considered a significant optimization, and this is the case for the XLC compiler. So when we do XLC, and even when we're doing 0 this compiler tries to generate FMA operations whenever it can, versus CLAN and GCC doesn't do it, because they are thinking that well when we say of zero we mean we don't want to do FMA. And that's the that's the main reason we have this this uh this result. So to really have the, the three numbers uh to have the, the, the same numbers in the three compilers, we need to tell XLC that we want O zero and that we don't want FMA. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind. Another issue is that even when we have a standard for floating point, some architectures do not implement the standard fully, and they have what they call deviations of the standard. So one example is NVIDIA GPUs. In NVIDIA GPUs, there are no mechanisms to detect exceptions, and um, exceptions such as division by zero or underflows are always masked. And so what this means is that there may be programs that may have numerical incorrect results because of an exception, and the programmer doesn't know about it because there's no mechanism in the GPU to detect that, right? And so this may be a little bit scary, but fortunately we are developing tools to solve this problem, and I'll show you later a tool that we are uh, developing to detect these problems in GPUs. So in the rest of the webinar, I will present uh, some existing tools and techniques for three areas of floating point analysis, uh, exceptions in GPUs, compiler variability, and mixed precision tuning. Unfortunately, as I said before, I cannot cover all the areas or problems related to floating point, but these are three areas that I believe are important today in scientific computing and HPC. Uh, at this point in the presentation, I could take uh, maybe one or two questions. Hi, Ignacio. Actually, we have three. Okay. Uh, so, so the first one, anything interesting in IEEE 754 update from 2018? So um, FMA is one of the most interesting things, I would say. Uh, so the standard started allowing uh, FMA operations. Um, which are now supported by some hardware, like GPUs, for example, support that, but not all hardware support that. Okay, next. Is floating point ever reproducible? Are there reproducible libraries that perform <laughs> floating point? Um, it depends on what level of reproducibility and what kind of reproducibility uh, you are thinking about. Um, I would say it's very difficult. Uh, we find a lot of problems when um, trying to reproduce a floating point uh, between machines. As I just, you know, as I just presented, uh, there are issues with compilers, uh, depending on, even in the same architecture, even when you're telling the compiler, do not optimize the code, compilers produce different code. So it's very, very difficult to, to uh, reproduce it. Okay, so next, what is a, in quotes, random test? I think that's because you used random test for Right, so the random test is a program. Um, Let me, okay, so it continues. How are these generated? The, right, example so, show, the example shown all seem like they are examples that use FMA. Um, the, so we have a grammar that defines what programs can be generated. This grammar is a subset of the C language. Uh, this grammar, the grammar supports features that you would see in HPC applications like um, for loops, its conditions, arithmetic operations, uh, math uh, calls, and things like that. And basically, the um, the the algorithm uses the grammar to generate 
uh, random programs. So it generates uh, lines of code using this grammar. Um, it, it can generate simple tests or it can generate very complex tests. Not all, not all the cases that we have uh, produced FMA, um, probably the one that I presented just as a case, but not, not all the time. Uh, one more question, Ignacio. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is the uh, so the IBM when you use the IBM compiler with the minus O zero, mm -hmm. is that result using FMA the correct one? Um, you know, to, to say what is correct here is difficult because uh, the the random test generator doesn't necessarily indicate what is the correct answer. All we can do here is to generate random tests in a given system and use all the compilers in the system to see what compilers produce, what group of compilers produce uh, the most reproducible results. So essentially, what we want to tell to the users is, okay, so you have this system with five or six compilers. What compilers should you use when you're running a code on the GPU versus running code on the host? And, you, and, and reproducibility is important for you, which compilers you could use. Whether the answers are correct or no, we cannot tell that. Okay, so that's it. Please go on. Okay. So in the rest of the webinar, I will present some existing tools and techniques for three. Well, I, I just mentioned that I guess um, that we're going to be using. We're going to be presenting um, analysis and tools for these three areas. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that uh, all the tools that I present are available here in this uh, website, uh, fbanalysistools.org. This is a website that we maintain for a tutorial that we give, uh, but you could also find links to the tools that um, I present here and some other tools as well. Okay, so um, moving to exceptions in GPU. So if we look at the problem of trapping exceptions in uh, floating point exceptions in CPU code, that's a solved problem. So when we have a CPU exception, uh, this is usually signal, uh, or it can be signal. So the system set or can set a flag, or it could take a trap. Uh, you could get a register set as well. So for example, in a Linux system, uh, can also cause the uh, floating point exception signal uh, to be triggered by uh, um, by the system, and then you can you can uh, catch this uh, using a signal handler, for example. So it's not a problem for, for CPUs. Problem is with GPUs that um, they don't support these. And as of right now, there's no mechanism to detect these exceptions. Uh, and as I mentioned before, so you may have hidden exceptions in your CUDA program if you don't do some, some checks, right? Uh, in the code, you may, you may see these, these exceptions. Um, or they, may, they may occur, but you don't know that they are occurring. Um, you could use some of the API calls from the CUDA specification to, for example, um, you, you could actually add pre-NEF statements to your program, as many as possible, and you could be printing uh, the results of many of your floating point operations. That's one approach you could, you could use. Another one is you could have a programming checks. Uh, in CUDA, for example, there is uh, these functions is nan that you could use uh, to check if a floating point is an is a NAN, or you could have also they also have support for is inf for infinity. Um, as you can imagine, these solutions are not ideal because you have to write this in the code. But most importantly, you know this this requires significant programming effort. The other problem with the uh, CUDA checks is that they don't support all classes of uh, uh, numbers. So, for example, there is no check for is uh, if you have a subnormal number. And so you'll have to build that by yourself. So we want a more automatic uh, way to detect these this errors in GPUs. And uh, for this reason, we are, we are building this tool, FP Shaker, that allows us to automatically detect uh, the location of floating point exceptions in NVIDIA GPUs. And we have been running this tool in uh, the LNL systems, uh, Lassen and Sierra, to help uh, users to detect these, these problems. Uh, the tool reports uh, the input operands. Uh, it uses a software-based approach uh, using the LVM compiler. 
So this is the design is all based on the LVM compiler. LVM is one of the solutions for the systems that we have in the lab. It's an open source compiler, so we can develop extensions to the compiler to check for these problems. And so essentially, uh, the design is that the compiler splits the compilation process into the host code compilation and the device code compilation. And in the, in the device code compilation, we instrument the code and add a runtime that will check whether or not you have an exception in a floating point ins instruction for all of the threads in the GPU. And uh, the usage is pretty simple. Uh, you have to compile your CUDA program with Clang. Um, that's that may be a, a problem for some codes. Um, so basically, you need to make sure that instead of using MVCC, you're going to compile with Clang. Clang supports compilation in CUDA. Uh, it doesn't have all the features that MVCC has, but it has um, a very good functionality, I would say, that would allow you to compile many programs. And then you have to add uh, some flags to tell the tool to load the instrumentation library and to include a runtime header file. That's pretty much all you have to do. Uh, we also check for uh, what we call latent underflows or overflows. So these are essentially numbers that are not, they are not yet uh, infinity or subnormal numbers, but they are kind of like in the limit, in the border of the normal numbers. So we do check for that as well. So you can you can see, for example, you have a computation that is getting really big or really small, and you need to take uh, you need to pay attention to that. And if you if you see an error, you you see a report like this where you can see the error, uh, the operation, the input, the file, and the line of code that uh, caused the error. The slowdown that we have seen so far by testing this with about three to four applications is in the order of 1.2 to 1.5x. All right, uh, now I, we will talk about compiler and this variability, but uh, before I move there, I could also get questions if we have. Yes, there is one here. It's perhaps re related to the previous one of the previous uh, questions. It's uh, maybe a, maybe a useful metric to be able to provide from these tools is to give users an expected absolute relative tolerance to expect in floating point values across the range of compilers, flags, etc., that are available in a given system for common cases, not exceptional ones that result in an expectedly very large diffs. This is more, I think, a kind of a suggestion than a question. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting suggestion. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. There's someone typing right now. Okay, so uh, is it possible that FP checker changes answers? Sometimes a bug only shows up in a release build and not a debug build. Would something similar happen with FP Checker? Um, for this kind of tool, I don't believe that this will be the case because um, this will not alter the the schedule. I would say that that you would see because we 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 do check. So basically, what happens is that every thread in the kernel that is running the GPU will perform exactly the same operation. We don't synchronize between threads. We don't perform any synchronization between threads. Uh, we, so every thread will go and, and perform the same check for each uh, floating point instruction. There will be some overhead, yes, um, but there's no synchronization. And if we see, if one of the threads sees a an exception, then we have a, a, an atomic operation where every, every other thread will, will, be, uh, will basically go away, and this thread that found the problem will print the report and will abort the, the kernel. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that this could uh, change uh, the, 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 the results or, or uh, the computations that are performed, because these are you know, uh, side by side operations that we do um, as the program runs. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see, I think. Okay, so are formalized tools feasible on large scale codes, e.g., Coq Plus, Flock QC? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get it. Can you say that again? Are formalized tools feasible on larger scale codes, 
formalized. You mean formal methods tools? Formal, I don't know what is formal. What is a formalized tool? Maybe formal. Uh, so I read formalized, but perhaps the participant meant formal. Formal methods, maybe formal methods tools like uh, model checking, verification. Um, so I think they are they are feasible, um, but we need to do more research into integration. Uh, we actually have a, a workshop on correctness in HPC in in supercomputing. Actually, I'll mention this workshop at the end of the presentation, where we are basically uh, getting together, you know, researchers in the area of correctness, formal methods, verification. We're getting together into this workshop to. Um, help in the process of um, making these tools more available, making these tools uh, more usable in in production codes. Um, I don't, I haven't seen any of these tools to be used in a large production code, personally, but I think it's possible. I think it's feasible with a little bit more research and work. <laughs> okay, please continue. All right. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Very, very nice questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's move to compiler variability. Uh, so I will talk about some of the techniques that uh, we use to debug this mini application case that I presented in the beginning of the, of the webinar. Uh, we use a technique called delta debugging, which helps us to manually identify the origin of the problem. And also I will present a tool called Fleet that performs this analysis in a more automatic manner. Okay, so I want to bring back this case again. Um, the question here is, how do we debug this, uh, right? So how do we find what the problem is here? So the root cause analysis process that we follow to debug this problem was that uh, given a bogey program, first we want to identify the file or files that are involved in this issue. And then we, within this file, we want to identify the function that could be causing the problem, and within this function, the lines of codes that are uh, possibly involved in the problem. So to analyze this problem, we use an algorithm called delta debugging, which is, is widely used in debugging. Um, it is used in debugging compilers in, in many other uh, software code bases. In particular, we use delta debugging to identify the file and function that causes problem. So it, this algorithm identifies inputs that make the problem manifest. Essentially, it, it identifies the minimum inputs. So if you eliminate one element from this input, the problem doesn't, doesn't manifest itself. And um, there's an algorithm for, for this, but I will not show the algorithm um, because I think that's boring. I think it's, it's more interesting to look at an example. So I'm going to show you an example of how this, this actually works for this particular kind of debugging. So let's, uh, let's look at this example. Let's say we have a program that has eight functions. This is our input. And let's say we get wrong results when function three and function seven are compiled with high optimization, but the remaining functions are compiled with low, low optimization. Now, we don't know that function three and seven are the problem, right? Because we, we compile the entire program with high optimization, but the algorithm will find that three and seven are the, the culprit. And so what the algorithm does is that in step one, it splits the input, uh, in this case, the functions, into, into uh, two chunks. And then in step two, it compiles chunk one with low optimization and then chunk, chunk two with high optimization. It does the same for chunk one and two, but in this case, chunk one with high optimization and the, the other one with low optimization. Now in these two cases, the error does not manifest because as we said, the bug is caused when function three and seven, both of them are compiled with high optimization. But in these two cases, we did not compile both of them with high optimization, so we don't see the problem. So the algorithm doesn't find anything in interesting here, right? So now what the algorithm does is that it, it uses a finer chunks or smaller chunks. So instead of two, now we have four, right, as you can see here. And then it uh, compiles uh, chunk one with low optimization and the other one with high optimization. And in this case, we see the problem. We see that uh, we have an incorrect answer. And this is the case because three and seven are in this uh, chunk where we use high, high optimization. So now we can we can essentially safely remove uh, we can remove chunk one 
uh, from the search, and then we continue with the second chunk. We continue doing the same thing, the same algorithm. And at the end, the, the algorithm tells us that three and seven are the ones that cause the problem, because when you compile only those two with high optimization, you see this, this error. So we implemented a program that runs this and uses the Excel compiler to uh, change the optimization levels. And we were able to debug this problem and to uh, identify essentially a, f a particular file in the application and a function that, that was causing this problem. And so here you can see the result. So when we do O2, we get a correct energy value. When we do O3, everywhere we get the incorrect value. But when we do O3, everywhere except that function that we found, we get a value that is more similar to O2. Right? So you get, you can see that the problem is, is now going away. So we also found other problems in this code. Uh, one of them is the use of subnormal numbers. Uh, we found that the combination of subnormal numbers and high optimization levels is is a dangerous combination. So my suggestion to all programmers is to not use subnormal numbers at all. And I have two reasons. One is that it may impact the performance uh, because we know that often in many architectures, including GPUs, subnormal operations are slower, tend to be slower. Um, there are details about that. It also depends on whether you can do FMA or not in the operation, but they tend to be slower than, than operations that don't have subnormal numbers. And the other reason, which I think, in my opinion, is more important, is that you lose too much precision when you are computing in the subnormal numbers domain. And so here's an example of how inaccurate subnormal numbers can be. Um, here we multiply a constant by, um, so the constant here is a subnormal number. So we multiply that constant by 1 divided by 3, right? So we have 1 divided by 3, which is the original value. We multiply by this constant. This constant is a subnormal number. Uh, we print the result. And then we denormalize it. We divide it now by the constant, right? So we are restoring the value back. But as you can see, we don't get, we don't get the, the initial value, right? So we don't get the value that we get when we divide 1 by 3. Um, and this can be solved if, if you use higher precision. Instead of using double, if you use long double, you don't have this issue, right? Uh, you, you restore the original value, essentially, even though you are multiplying by a denormalized value. Right, so the takeaway here is that you should not be operating in the domain of subnormal numbers. Um, often we see applications doing it. Sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they think that the application can handle it. They say, they, they tell us, well, you know, my algorithm can handle subnormal numbers. So I don't, have a, I don't have a problem with that. But sometimes they don't know. Sometimes they don't know that, that this is happening, which is scary to me. Um, so the question, really the question is, can we actually avoid uh, subnormal numbers? Um, and um, by the way, we can have a full webinar only on this topic, on the topic of how to have applications avoid uh, subnormal numbers. So here I'm just going to give you a, uh, some ideas uh, to avoid subnormal numbers. So one is you could use higher precision. As I presented in the previous example, if you use higher precision, that is not a problem necessarily. It could be a problem, but maybe not for the inputs that you have. Um, now, this is a research problem because now you want to do what's called mixed precision, where possibly you're doing double precision everywhere, but in some parts of your program you're doing higher precision. Uh, there are questions about how do you do the casting operations, because you have to convert those, uh, those results to a higher precision. So this is really a research problem that is going on uh, these days. How do you do that effectively without impacting the performance of your code? And later in the presentation, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present some examples of why, why mixed precision is hard. You could do scale up, scale down, um, right? So if you scale up the computations you have, you're not, you're not close to the domain of subnormal numbers. But then you have other problems, right? Because most of the precision that you have is, is in lower numbers. So if you scale up, you, you also lose precision. Um, 
It could work for simple problems only. I don't know. I mean, I haven't tried this in, in large applications. Um, so it may solve the problem, but it may introduce other problems. So something to keep in mind. You could also flush overflows to zero. So architecture, some architecture allow you to do that. GPUs is one of them. Um, uh, what this, hap what this uh, allows you is, is that whenever there is a subnormal operation, it will be promoted to a zero value. Uh, this doesn't fix the underlying problem because your, st your algorithm is still generating subnormal numbers, right? But it eliminates performance issues because now you will not have operations in this domain. These values will be converted to zero. And there are algorithmic changes that you can do, and there are many papers that talk about different algorithms that you could use to avoid subnormal numbers. There are actually a few books that talk about this. So the topic for, uh, for an entire webinar, I won't go into the details of this. I just wanted to mention this, uh, these possibilities. So in the previous uh, example, we identified the root problem uh, in a single function using delta debugging, as I mentioned. This process was very manual, in essence. Uh, there's a tool that you can use to isolate problems like this in a more automatic manner. Uh, the name of the tool is FLIT. Uh, FLIT provides a method to analyze compiler-induced variability. This tool provides multiple levels of analysis. Uh, it can determine compilation options that influence floating point variability in programs. It can analyze the trade-off of reproducibility and performance for a given compiler. Um, it can also identify files, functions that cause variability due to compilations, like the example we, we saw before. It uses a bisection search algorithm as opposed to a delta debugging algorithm that we use. And uh, this can identify the, the function that caused the problem uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, the main developer is Mike Bentley at the University of Utah. And again, if you go to this link that you see in the um, in the bottom of the presentation, you can you can find a link to this tool. So now we are moving into the area of mixed precision, which is the last part of the presentation. But I can take questions here as well. Okay, so uh, there are I think three uh, questions here. Four. First, are subnormal numbers same as underflow? Um, if you go to Wikipedia, it says yes, they are the same. Um, I forget what the standard says about that. I treat them, I personally treat them as underflows. Okay, and then yeah. next question then. Uh, Khan, um, emeritus professor at UC Berkeley and the father of IEEE 754, has several examples of where subnormal numbers help improve the results of expressions. Mm -hmm. Do you have comments on that? Um, that's an interesting point. I haven't seen cases like that. Um, here in Livermore, uh, usually we see problems between uh, subnormals and when they are combined with high optimization levels, mm -hmm. they produce very, very different results, like the example I presented with the Excel compiler. Um, personally, I haven't seen any case where subnormal numbers uh, improve the results. Uh, that's an interesting point. So next to question then, uh, Nacio. In the fixed, in quotes, Raja example, the value still seemed to differ in the fourth significant digit. Isn't that still really bad? Yes, that's correct. So actually, uh, in this case, we had to go deeper into the problem. We identified the function, right? And so when we compile this function with lower optimization level, we improve the result. But um, actually, maybe I can show the slide here quickly. Um, here. Yeah, so the result is still uh, not the same, the, the one that you would expect, uh, the one that we get with O2 or from other compilers. But there are other problems in the code. There are subnormal numbers. And in this function, there are some operations as well that we had to identify. There, there were some divisions that the compiler was promoting to um, a reciprocal operations. And all of this combined with uh, subnormal numbers produce this error. So we didn't, we didn't end the debugging at this point. I'm just showing you the process we follow to find the function. But after the function, we have to find the line of code. And when we found, when we found those, we actually f uh, correct the problem to the, to the expected result. I just didn't show this here in the presentation because of time. Okay, we have three interesting questions here, but let's uh, please continue, Nacho. We'll, uh, you know, uh, leave them for the end. Okay, sure. 
All right, so uh, this is the last uh, part of the presentation. So this is another area of interest in uh, floating point analysis in mixed precision. Uh, the idea is to use uh, lower precision sometimes, uh, or sometimes higher precision, right? Um, in the case of lower precision is to uh, use it in some part of the program to increase the performance of the program. Uh, in the two areas that I discussed before, GPU exceptions and compiler variability, we needed to think about correctness, correctness of floating point. In this kind of analysis, mixed precision, you have to think about correctness and performance. So the two things, which is tricky. So um, what you see here is a visualization of Lulesh. Lulesh is a proxy application that simulates a shock hydro problem. Uh, it's developed here at, at the uh, LNL. And uh, here you're, you're looking at two visualizations of, of two runs of Lulesh. If you look at the visualizations only, you probably won't see any difference. But if you look at the result, the numerical results, you will see a difference. And the difference is that in the, in the first round, we're doing a run with full double precision. So all the variables are in double precision. In the second round, we are using a mixed precision case where some of the operations are in double precision and some of the other operations, excuse me, are in single precision. And if we let the accuracy to have six digits, so in this case, this is accuracy of the second run versus the run one, which is the baseline because everything is in double. If we let this accuracy to have six digits, we can get a 10% improvement of uh, speed up. And if we let the accuracy to have three digits of accuracy, in this case, we can have up to uh, 46%. So the question for this kind of analysis is what can, how can we uh, take advantage of floating point mixed precision, right? So what you see here is um, the, essentially you're looking at the performance ratio of different NVIDIA GPUs. So the floating point precision levels in NVIDIA GPUs have increased over the years. So in the beginning, the first NVIDIA GPUs only supported one level, only single precision. Then in about compute capability 1.3, they started supporting two levels. They could do a, a double precision and single precision. But the ratio, the ratio of double to to single was uh, relatively low. So you could do one operation in double versus eight operations in single, right? Later on, we saw architectures that had even lower ratio. But these days, um, these uh, GPUs support three levels of precision. So you could do double, single, and half precision, right? And the ratio is actually higher because you could do one in double versus two in single. And I think that in the future, we may have a four level because right now here, the market is dominated by machine learning, deep learning. And we know there are papers showing that you could do training of, of uh, neural networks with precision lower than half, uh, half precision. So I'm thinking we may have a four level in the future. Now the question is how can we take advantage of this trend? to improve the performance of codes, right? Now, mixed precision programming is challenging. Uh, programs have many variables. And if we consider two levels of precisions, we have two to the power of n combinations. If we consider three levels, we have three to the power of n combinations. So that's, that's a very large space. So we really need automatic methods to find good configurations for a mixed precision, a floating point mixed precision. So here's an example that shows how difficult this is. This is a small kernel uh, of an M-body simulation. This is a CUDA kernel. Uh, here, this kernel is computing the forces of the bodies. And so here we, we do, let's do a, a little exercise here where uh, we change the, the precision of some of the variables in the kernel. So initially everything is double and we're gonna change some of them to float. And we're going to calculate an error uh, to see how well we're doing. In this particular case, the error we're using is the difference of the positions of the particles. Uh, you could do different error functions for your application. For this case, we're using this one because it works very well. 
So uh, when we change all the variables to float, we get this error, 15, and we have a speed of uh, 53%. Maybe it is a good speed up, but uh, I think this error may be too large. Maybe it's too large. So let's, instead of changing all the variables, we're going to change one variable here. When we change one variable to float, we get a smaller error here, but the speed up is 5%, so maybe this is too low speed up, right? Now we change another variable, and the error is, is, is very low, it's 1.93, but the speed of it is negative. So what this means is now we're making the program slower, so we definitely don't, don't want this case. Right? And at the end, we found that three variables, when we change these three variables, we get the smallest error, and we have a reasonable speed of 11%. So this shows why Correctness is not, it's not the only thing to consider. We also have to consider the performance aspects of uh, mixed precision. There's a lot of research going on in this domain. Um, I just wanted to mention some of the uh, uh, recent uh, research uh, results on this, on this area. So we have done some work on floating point mixed precision tuning for GPUs recently. Uh, we presented a, a technique called GPU mixer. It's a method that automatically allows programmers to find mixed precision configurations when um, we observe improvements when the code is executed in NVIDIA GPUs and where we also maintain the level of accuracy uh, within, within the constraints that the programmer has. And this uh, paper was presented in the ISC conference uh, a few months ago. One of the existing uh, tools for automatic floating point mixed precision tuning is Presimonius. Uh, this tool takes as input a, a program, an error threshold, and a set of inputs for the program. It uh, performs a search over the types of variables in the program to determine uh, how much precision they need. The analysis produces, produces a, a listing of floating point variables and also the, uh, the suggested types, uh, which the tool refers as a type configuration. And uh, when the type configuration is applied to the original program, the final program produces a result within the given error threshold, and it is faster than the original program. Um, the source code for this tool is available. The main, main developer is uh, Cindy Rubio Gonzalez at UC Davis. Another tool for mixed precision tuning is ADAPT. Uh, the tool uses algorithmic differentiation for error analysis. Uh, this tool allows programmers to understand how uh, the output changes with respect to the errors in the variables of a program. And in this case, it considers a program as a function of inputs and intermediate variables that compute some output. And um, in the error prediction model, uh, they use essentially a first order Taylor series approximation around the input to compute uh, what they call error estimates. And so here, for example, let's say X is any input or intermediate variable in the program, and Y is the output variable, then the error is Y, well, in this case, the error in Y is F prime of A times the error in X. So the key idea here is to use a algorithmic differentiation to obtain F prime of, F prime of A. This tool provides output sections of the program that um, need uh, to be in higher precision. So you can see here the, the uh, left uh, part of the slide to see highlights of a program. And um, they have used these in several benchmarks and they have found good uh, speed ups. Uh, if you want more, more information of this tool, the main developer is Harshita Menon. He's here at uh, Lawrence River National Laboratory. Uh, you can contact her. All right, so before I finish this webinar, I wanted to mention that we have a tutorial at SC, the SC conference that covers these tools and other tools for, for floating point analysis. In the tutorial, we present some of the tools that I, that I present today, but also some other tools I did not present. So for example, tools for uh, controlling non-determinism in MPI programs that could change the floating point behavior of your program. So for example, when you are getting messages in different orders in MPI, and depending on the order of the messages, you compute different, your program computes different uh, 
floating point values. So you can control this with a tool called Rempy that we present in this tutorial. Um, uh, this allows you to do, for example, um, a record and replay for debugging. We present other tools as well, uh, for example, for data rate checking and so on. This is a hands-on tutorial, so we provide real exercises of how, how to run these tools in real programs. So if you want to learn more, please attend the tutorial at SC. And we also organize a workshop on correctness for HPC applications. And uh, one of the key topics of the workshop is correctness of floating point. In fact, we have a session with, so this year we have a session with two papers on the topic of uh, mixed precision. Um, and I have put here the URL of the workshop so you can uh, check the program. So the, the tutorial is on Sunday and the workshop is on Monday. So there's no overlap, so you can attend the two of them. And so uh, here is just a list of some useful references. Um, the first is a group of uh, sites, uh, papers, and, and, and videos on general guidance about floating point issues. And the second is information about uh, NVIDIA GPUs and floating point arithmetic. So in summary, um, there are many factors that can affect floating point results. Uh, keep in mind that it's, it's not only the uh, rounding error, uh, there are aspects such as the compiler you're using, uh, the hardware you're running the code on, the optimizations you're using, the precision you're using, and the parallelism that you're using. Uh, be aware of how compiler optimizations could change the results of the program. Um, avoid the use of subnormal numbers if possible. Um, you lose too much precision in, in most of the cases. Uh, pay attention to floating point computations on GPUs. Uh, just because uh, in some GPUs, uh, floating point is not fully implemented, there are deviations and there could be exceptions, for example, that uh, you need to check. And uh, mixed precision involves correctness, but also performance analysis. And finally, the, uh, the, probably the, the most interesting takeaway I want to give here is that the tools community is your friend. Uh, we want to hear from you. If um, we, if you have an issue and we don't have a tool that solves your problem, we would like to develop this tool and, and work with you to uh, help you be more productive. Uh, thank you to the uh, BSS uh, organization and ECP for providing funding for this work. And here I'm giving you my contact information. Please contact me if you have any questions. And this is a disclaimer that I have to present uh, but with this, I, uh, this is the end of my, my presentation, and I can take questions. Hello? Are you still there? Yes, I believe we have some more questions that have come in. Um, yep. Ozzy, do you want to ask them, and I'll hand you presenters. Yes, uh, so we have some more questions here, Ignacio. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, do you have thoughts, comments on how lossy compression of floating point data and or using half precision, either at two polar home group impacted these issues? Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, there are researchers, researchers in uh, Lawrence Livermore that are looking at that. I personally have not dealt with this in real applications. I mean, most of the work that I do um, applies to uh, large-scale applications that are running in our system. I personally haven't seen uh, this kind of computation where um, compression is used, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic, uh, very interesting idea to explore. Another one, do the tools you presented support parallel programs, either OpenMP and or MPI? That's a good question. So um, <clears throat> the tools that I presented here, um, let's see. Mm, so FP Shaker is for CUDA, right? Uh, we are working on um, supporting OpenMP as a, as a way to support more you know, different programming models because usually we don't have a lot of programs written directly in CUDA, but we do have, uh, inter you know, intermediate layers like Raja that can convert the loops to OpenMP or some other model. So we're working on 
um, supporting um, other programming models. In the tutorial, we do have tools that support OpenMP and MPI. So for example, we have Rempi, a tool that allows you to control the non-determinism in MPI. Um, for MPI, it's not very difficult to add support for these tools, I would say, because um, usually what you have to do is um, just allow the tool to run in MPI processes in parallel. Uh, the problem is how do you gather the traces in a central point, right? So you could do, you could allow the tools to write files for each process and do an offline analysis, or there are other methods we sometimes use, for example, to gather all the traces at the end of the program before, um, or at the point where the program uses or calls uh, MPI finalize. We can gather all the traces and perform the analysis. So MPI is not very difficult, I would say. Um, Multi-thread models are more difficult to add. Uh, just a comment here before going to the next question. We are going to ask Ignacio to go through all these questions and, and, and answer in the Google Doc uh, later, and we'll make the link available to all participants. So another question in us, what is needed for these tools to work with posits and unums? Hmm. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I think these, uh, you know, unums are, are very, very interesting, fascinating topic. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with UNUM just because I don't see a lot of programs using this format here in the lab I, where I perform my work. Mostly I see programs using floating point and hardware implementing floating point. So these are the tools that we are developing. Having said that, um, I think you know alternative uh, formats could solve some of the problems of floating point and perhaps we don't need all these tools, right? If you're using a different format that doesn't have um, many corner cases like floating point, maybe maybe my job is not needed anymore and we don't have to write tools for that. <laughs> um, but I cannot give more comments on that because I don't really have a lot of experience on Unum and I don't, I don't use it regularly. I don't see applications running this regularly. Yeah. Good. Right, so do you believe the return on investment in this mixed precision strategy, like much higher code complexity, more difficulty in reproducing, et cetera, is likely to produce higher performance benefits than other or typical performance improvement strategies? Well, here we need to define what is other, right? If you want me to compare floating point mixed precision to loop optimizations, aggressive loop optimizations, or something else, we'll, we'll have to look into the details here. So all, all I can say is that the the traditional speed up you would expect from something like a floating point misposition is 2x, because most codes are doing double everywhere. And if you, you know, the best you could do is do single, you know, if you, if you lower down everything, you would do, you would have something like 2x of speed up. But I think you could do better than 2x if you consider lower level of precision, uh, half precision, for example, right? Then you could do definitely more more than 2x, maybe 5x, maybe even 10x. I don't know. This is a research question that is hard to answer. We really need more research in understanding uh, where we can use these different levels of precision in a, in a given application. Okay, so there is one question that I think is more a comment, uh, but you can go for the, to the, uh, for the f final question, I think. In trying to optimize mixed precision code, does each variable contribute to the error and the speed up independently? Independently. I don't know what this means. What is independently here? Um, um, I, I don't understand what is meant by independently here. I guess the question is, um, what are the dependencies of a given variable um, in terms of uh, influencing the, the speed up? Okay, so the, right. the participant's writing a little more here. So let's, uh, okay, so while we, we wait for the participants to finish the question, I'd like to take the opportunity to announce you know what is going to happen here to say what is going to happen with the series in at the end of the year the rest of the year we are going we are skipping november because of the sc conference we have uh, people are very busy and uh, december 11 we are uh, working on a work uh, webinar for that date and the topic and the speaker uh, still to be announced 
Uh, remember uh, to all participants, uh, please, we'd like to improve the series. Uh, give us feedback uh, on the, the recording and the slides and the question and answers. All We have two, two links. All the material related to this webinar will be available there. So going then back to the question, Ignacio. All right, so in trying to optimize mixed precision code, does it variable contribute to the error and speed up independently? It's like if you're changing the precision of variable one, mm -hmm. you would some error on the speed up and changing mm -hmm. the precision of variable two, you would some error in the speed up. So does the total error in the speed up add together? Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer this. So, so one thing I have to say is that changing the 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 precision of variables, I don't think is the right approach because a given variable will affect several operations or could affect several operations, you know, actual instructions in your program. So, if you change the precision of one variable, this may affect. 10 or maybe 20 instructions in your program, right? And what you really want to change is the operations and the data, right? So maybe the, the best program that I want out of those 10 operations, uh, maybe I want to change three operations only out of 10. But if I change the type of the variable, I'll, I will either change all the operations or none of them. Right. So really, this approach of changing variables is probably not the best, in my opinion. Um, I don't know if this answers the question, but I, I, I guess I would need to understand better what's, uh, how do we calculate the error here and what kind of error we want to optimize here. Yeah, so for the sake of time, I think we can stop here so that the participant, if uh, he or she would like to add more to the question, I okay. think we can address the question later. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today for this webinar. And also, of course, Ignacio, thank you very much. A number of uh, very good, uh, very nice, in interesting questions here. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. And